Amen. Oh. Now, I want you to turn to your neighbor and tell them, my neighbor, I love you. And I'm not intimidated by your presence around me. Amen. So I want us in a wholesale way, we lift our hands above our head and give Jesus a hand of praise before we sit. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Now, I request you to sit and take a pen, take also a notebook so that you do this exercise. Amen. We are doing an exercise, a spiritual exercise of writing in the church. God told Jeremiah to write every word he was speaking to him in a book. Now, open a new page, not an old one, a new page, and write every mountain you are facing, every trouble you are facing, everything which you are facing, which you are thinking, this one, it may be health, it may be finance, it may be, let me not say mine, because I'm writing mine. Amen. Write them down. You know, we were told we have to tunya every mountain this year. Level it. Get our breakthrough. So anything you are facing in your life, in your family, it may be even from previous years, write it down. Have you written it? Come on, I want us to look at these scriptures. Just a few scriptures, two scriptures, so that we move together. Amen. One of the scriptures is in the book of <coughs> okay in the book of John 5 verses 19 this is what the scripture says can we read together what the scripture says so jesus explained aha uh -huh. the son can do nothing by himself he does only what he sees the father doing. Whatever the father does, the son also. So how many sons and daughters of God do I have in the house? So whatsoever you see God do, you need to do what? To do it. What you see your father God do, you need also to be doing it. Amen? Because you are a son. Now give us these other two scriptures, Psalms 37 verses 12, and also uh, verse 13 also, then Psalm 59 verse 8. Psalms 37 verses 12 and 13. This is what the scripture says. We are reading together loud. The wicked plots against the just and gnashes at him with his teeth. Verse 13. Aha. Uh -huh. So the Lord does what? The Lord loves. The Lord loves. Psalms 59 verses 8. What does it say? It says, But you, O Lord, come on, we are reading together. But you, O Lord, shall laugh at them. So what does our Father God do? He loves. And one important thing is laughing. Laughing. Now, God laughs because there is something important in laughter. Let me just explain in a minute so that uh, I lead you into what is needful. 
God's laughter is world splitting. His enemies cower in fear. His friends rise in comfort. His laughter warns cosmic traitors of their impending doom while reminding weak saints that their best is yet to come. Now, laughter has practical health benefits like releasing tension, lowering anxiety, boosting the immune system, and aiding circulation. Laughter is social also. It's contagious. If one person begins to love, you find others also joining to love. Now, God loves for our sake to communicate to us. He loves to give off signals and signals that are horrible to, the, to his enemies and wonderful to us as his friends. Laughter for God and for us is an unfable form of communication. It acknowledges that more is going on that meets the eye, that more is happening than what is being captured into words. Now, God loves to dispel our fears. God loves to remind us that no purpose of his concerning us can be thwarted. Are we together, church? Our father does what? He loves. Now, we have identified maybe the mountains or the things which we face, and we've written. Now, if you've written, I want you to cross them up. Then you write in capital letters, God. Write God. And I want you to sit as you sit. You open up where you've written because our Father loves, I want to give you a minute or so just to look at those things and love. <laughs> just love. Continue doing it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just love at them. Love at them. You know, j God says, who are you, O great mountain, before Serubabel? In other words, God is laughing at it. You think you are a mountain before my people. You think you are a problem. At any my problem. No, 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 no. This is not my problem. Yeah. So just love. Take a minute and love. <laughs> uh, are you loving church? Yeah. So as you go home, Take it. Write whatsoever you, ha you couldn't write and just take your time and laugh at them. Amen. Well, this morning, we are beginning of a series and part of that series is what we have done this morning. Part of it is that and the series is spiritual disciplines or practices that make our faith grow strong. Spiritual disciplines of the Christian life. And these are practices that make our faith strong. Now, it will continue for almost maybe two or so months just looking at these spiritual disciplines. And it's important, it's great for us as a church that we prepare, we come in church, we come ready to learn, we come ready to get whatsoever we will be taught so that we continue to practice, we continue to exercise them in our day-to-day -day lives. Now, spiritual disciplines are practices that make our faith strong. Just as there is no faith that does not act, so there is no act without a plan. Let me come up again. Just as there is no faith that does not act, so there is no act without some plan. Now, in life, faith is very important. But faith without works, the scripture says it's a dead faith. 
And there is no acting without a plan. Praise the Lord, church. If you will act, you need some plan. If you will do something, you need some plan. You can't just arise and say, I'm going to Narok. No, you have to see which road leads to Narok. You have to plan which time am I to wake up and what time am I intended to be in Narok. So you plan yourself. Am I to take something or I will take something somewhere on the road as I go? You plan yourself. Don't just think godliness happens. It comes by the grace of God and the spiritual disciplines that are the vehicle which God uses. Godliness, when we are talking of spiritual disciplines, they are just avenues that lead us into a life of godliness. Now, this, they don't just come, but they come by God's grace and the discipline which we cultivate in life because God uses those disciplines to cultivate a godly life in you and in me. So my prayer is this simple, that daily we will make priorities on how to move forward in our lives so that we are not stagnant, but we move forward. Amen. Now, a few things to understand because I'm just laying a foundation today. Just as every athlete must train to win, every Christian must make their faith strong through spiritual disciplines. Let me come up again. Just as every athlete, athlete must train to win, every Christian must make their faith strong through spiritual disciplines. Your faith cannot be strong unless you are exercising these spiritual disciplines. And we are saying that nobody, nobody can sit on the couch eating chips for months and hope to compete. Like the guys who are competing right now in athletes, they are doing so because they have taken time to exercise. And therefore, they went to compete. No one stood to eat, just eat ugali, eat chips, eat everything. And they went to compete. It can't happen. There is a discipline which they cultivate before. So the best athletes are intensely disciplined. They follow strict diet and exercise regimens to beat their body into peak physical condition. So when the game is on the line, they are ready. Yeah. And we know this is true for our physical condition, but there is a disconnect with how we think about our spiritual condition. I was telling the first service that when I used to play football and volleyball, especially in high school, we could wake up very early in the morning at around four. Yeah. The, our team, especially when we are going for provincials and so forth, we wake up very early. And now we have to go for road work. We run, we run, we run. When we find some mountain uh, or an uphill, we begin to exercise from that uphill down for some time before we return back. And we did it several times, several times, doing it several times. We understand there. But sometimes we forget about the spiritual life that we are in, that it's the same. The sad reality is that many Christians are unfit because they are undisciplined. Tell your neighbor, I am not so. We need to be disciplined. Amen? Yeah, as believers, not undisciplined. Now, nobody drifts into discipline. Just as the undisciplined body becomes lackish and fat, the undisciplined spirit becomes weak. This is amazing that if we are not disciplined spiritually, our spirit man becomes so weak, so weak, so weak. Amen. 
Now, Paul advises Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. He tells Timothy that train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds the promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. So godliness is an exercise which we need to be exercising because it's profitable now and it's also profitable in the future. Amen? Praise the Lord Church. Very important. Let me give us a story about a certain king. Now, this story teaches us something very important. And it goes like this. Once upon a time, there was a rich king who had four wives. He loved the fourth wife the most and adored her with rich robes and treated her to finest of delicacies. He gave her nothing but the best. Now, let me sound a warning to every man in the house. I'm not advocating for you to get the second, the third, and fourth wife. Look at the man around you and tell them, Amen. Now, he also loved his second wife. She was his confidant and was always kind, considerate, and patient with him. Whenever the king faced a problem, he could confide in her and she would help him get through the difficult times. He also loved the third wife very much and was always showing her off to neighboring kingdoms. However, he feared that one day she would leave him for another. Now, the king's first wife was a very loyal partner and had made great contributions in maintaining his wealth and kingdom. However, he did not love the first wife. Although she loved him deeply, he hardly took notice of her. But one day, the king fell ill. And he knew his time was short. He was about to die. So he thought of his luxurious life and wondered, I now have four wives with me. But when I die, I will all be alone. Thus he asked the fourth wife, I loved you the most, and loved you with the finest clothing, and showered great care over you. Now that I am dying, Will you follow me and keep me company? No way, replied the fourth wife. And she walked away without a word. Her answer cut like a sharp knife right into his heart. He then asked the second wife, I've always turned to you for help, and you've always been there for me. When I die, will you follow me and keep me company? I'm sorry, I can't. Help you out this time, replied the second wife. At the very most, I can only walk with you to your grave. Her answer struck him like a bolt of lightning, and the king was devastated. Now, the sad king then asked the third wife, I loved you all my life. Now that I am dying, will you follow me and keep me company? No. No replied the third wife, life is too good. When you die, I'm going to remarry. His heart sunk and turned cold. Then a voice called out, I'll go with you. I'll follow you no matter where you go. The king looked up and there was his first wife. She was very skinny as she suffered from malnutrition and neglect. Greatly grieved, the king said, I should have taken much better care of you when I had the chance. Now, let's look at the moral of this story. The fourth wife is our body. Come on, just look at your body. The way we swing it, the way we cloth it, the way we... Here. Take good care of it. 
So we love our body with our first affection. And we devote our whole life decorating it with excite ornaments and clothes. However, no matter how much time and effort we lavish in making it look good, it will leave us when we die. The second wife, our second wife is our friends, our families, and our relatives. We love them and trust them. And in exchange, they also offer us some comfort and aid when we are in need. But no matter how close they have been there for us, when we are alive, the farthest they can stay by us is up to the grave. They will just escort us, escort us. Then when we are lowered down, they cry a little bit. Then they go back to continue with life. No one will go there with us. Now, the third wife is our property, our position, and our riches. We expend a lot of our time and attention seeking to accumulate property. But all the things we have gained won't come with us when we die. Alternatively, when the third wife claims she will be remarried after the king dies, all our property is split and offered to others. When we die, they go to others. And I know here we have our people, they've written wills that when I die, <laughs> you will not carry what you have, but it goes to, okay, we don't want to say. Our, our first wife is our spirit. We know our souls in search of riches, enjoyment, and strength. Never knowing that it's only our spirit that goes with us as we die. Sure, we do ought to take care of our bodies, stay well and exercise. We ought to have a nice time or things for our associates and family. Yet, we should not forget to take care of the biggest treasure, our spirit. Tell your neighbor from today, I'm taking good care of my spirit. Amen. Very important. Now, what are the spiritual disciplines? What are the spiritual disciplines? Spiritual disciplines are practices that by design can lead to life transformation. Spiritual disciplines are practices that by design can lead to life transformation. They are practices that help us create time and space for transformation. Transformation is very important, but unless there are practices which we are undertaking, then we can't experience a transformed life. So there is that need for us to give space and time to these practices. Every practice needs time. It needs space. So we have to endeavor to give time and space to these practices. Praise the Lord Church. Amen. Now, spiritual disciplines are the believers' practices that aid our spiritual growth as disciples of Christ. And they also deep, deepen our relationship with God. They are spiritual practices that aid our spiritual growth as disciples of Christ. And they deepen our relationship with God. They are like training exercises for the spiritual life. Just like physical exercise, we have to choose to do them regularly to feel or see their impact in our lives. So when we are looking at spiritual disciplines, they help our spiritual growth. We want to grow spiritually. Or God wants us to grow spiritually. So they help us to grow. Praise the Lord. 
I, I was telling the first service, and also let me say to us that when you were born, you were taught how to do what? To take milk. You began to take milk. You graduated, you also began to take porridge. Yeah, plus all those malenges which you don't like now. You began to take them. And you graduated, you began to take some solids. Now you can take any solid. Tell your neighbor, now I can take any solid. Yeah, I, I know very well, including sugar can, including roasted maize, including all those hard stuff. You can take them. You graduated. So also in our spiritual life, we need to move on. The scripture begins to tell us that we need to desire the sincere spiritual milk of the word, thereby we may grow. Now, after we are going on in our growth, we graduate now, we begin solid food. Yeah. Solid, uh, solid food. Bones of the word. Whereby you are taught the word, then you begin, you, you are heard, you are just saying, Lord, speak, Lord, because he's dissecting, defying the marrow, the spirit, everything in you. You are just seeing yourself, Lord, this is me. This is me. Yeah. You begin to grow. Amen. Have you ever read a scripture in your house? Then you begin to move around your house. You're just moving around your house. Because God is speaking to you. Spiritual food. Amen. Oh, we are so busy. Spiritual disciplines, one of the enemies is our busyness. Being busy. Yeah. <laughs> we who are parents, we know this. If your child doesn't come to eat, when you have made food, it's time for food. And they are outside playing, 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 playing. You know what you always do. Yeah? That fimbo which you have placed somewhere, or that mushipi which you have, or that slippers, you know how you are using it. So that the child knows if it's eating time is eating time. I have to eat. Was it benefiting you? Huh? Maybe it was sparing you some money for hospital. But the thing is, <laughs> you, wa you wanted the child to benefit, to grow. Because without eating, they cannot grow. They cannot be healthy. Amen? So also, maybe some of us, no wonder the scripture says, do not take lightly the discipline of the Lord. May the Lord discipline us. Can the church say amen? amen? Because he loves him whom? Yeah. Because sometimes we are wayward. It's feeding time, but we are playing games, running here and there. <laughs> oh, that is a prayer which we need not to make on the pulpit. Because somebody will be spanked for good. Amen. Praise the Lord. Do you still love me? Okay. Now, the purpose of spiritual discipline is to deepen our relationship with God. And we are saying, why? Because the spiritual disciplines are tools that aid and guide us on our journey in relationship with God. And also they develop our spiritual growth and nurture a healthy spiritual life. Now, there are two books. I pray that you can get hold of one and begin to read these things because we are not just teaching for ourselves. No, no, no. We want ourselves to know these things so that we move with them. Amen? We practice them. When we call for like something like a prayer meeting, suppose we are all full. The whole day we are praying in this place, the way we are here, Pastor Beatrice. A Shiloh worship center. Fila tumeja tu hivi. Kila mtu ako anarababa. Anashanda rababa. 
I tell you, heaven will move. <laughs> Amen. So, one of the books is by Richard Foster, and the book is Celebration of Discipline, The Path of Spiritual Growth. And he gives us the three aspects of the spiritual discipline. Are we together, media team? Amen. Can you just give us that slide? I know it's down somewhere. Okay. So, he gives us the three parts of the spiritual discipline, and we have the inward disciplines, which speaks of meditation, prayer, fasting, and study. Those are inward disciplines. Then he gives us the outward disciplines, which are simplicity, which are solitude, which are submission, and service. Outward disciplines. Then he gives us corporate disciplines, which are confession, worship, guidance, celebration. So that is one of the books which, as a believer, if you can get it, that book, Celebration of Discipline, The Path of Spiritual Growth, it can be very helpful. Then the second book is by the man, Dallas Willard. He has written a book called The Spirit of the Disciplines, Understanding How God Changes Lives. Yeah. The Spirit of Disciplines, Understanding How God Changes Lives. And he has grouped the spiritual disciplines, which he has named, into two uh, sections. One is the abstinence, or disciplines of abstinence, which speaks of solitude which speaks of silence, which speaks of fasting, focality, chastity, secrecy, and sacrifice. Then he has also given the second group of disciplines of engagement, where we have to engage, and that speaks of study, worship, celebration, service, prayer, fellowship, confession, and submission. Now, there are other others, they will give you even more disciplines. But all these disciplines, they have been tested. The Lord Jesus Christ practiced them in his earthly life. And the disciples were also initiated into practicing them. Then the saints of old have been practicing these things. And they work. Amen? They work. So we as a church, we as individual believers, we need to cultivate them because they will work for us and for our good. Amen. Are we together? So quickly, let, let's just look, because we are just laying a foundation. Let's quickly look at a few of them, highlighting a few of them. And we are looking at the seven disciplines of abstinence. And number one is solitude. Solitude. Amen. Solitude. Now, solitude speaks of spending time alone with God. You just spend time alone with God. You separate yourself from your activities, from people and so forth, so that you are together just with God. Creating room for him and him alone with you. Amen? Yeah. I know we have here people who are going to Karura just alone. They spend the whole day alone with God. Yeah. Or Katoloni or wherever where you are going. But others, they only thrive in a company of many believers. Please, we need a moment of solitude with God. Amen? So we need to know how we can cultivate our solitude time with God. Yeah. Whereby we are alone in the audience of one God. Now, the second one is fasting. Fasting. I know we have been taught on fasting, and we were practicing fasting. 
But look at your neighbor and tell them, I don't know what you are doing. Yeah, ask them, ask them, were you fasting? Yeah. <laughs> so fasting is abstaining from food to express our dependence on God. So all this we will be looking at still so that we grow in them. We're practicing, we practicing them more and more. Then number three is denial. Tell your neighbor denial. Now, denial is intentionally denying yourself certain legitimate pleasures to find your sufficiency in God or a higher fulfillment in God. And like in our church, during encounter, we are denied by force, by fire, to look at our phones so that we find our sufficiency, our fulfillment in God. And some of us here, we have testified how God met us during that time. And that shows that if we could deny ourselves of certain things, then we could be meeting with God frequently. Amen? We could be meeting with God frequently. It's not just an encounter. God doesn't stay at... Huh? He doesn't stay there. <laughs> he wants to meet with us daily. Amen? Yeah. <laughs> I don't have a luxury of time to give us scriptures so that you understand that he wants actually to meet with each one of us every morning, every day, every morning. He meets with us. Then number four is sacrifice. Sacrifice. Now, sacrifice speaks of giving of ourselves and our resources beyond what seems reasonable to express our dependence on God. Yeah, the time, the service, the money. Now, there is a quotation by C.S. Lewis. That is one of the great men of God that lived in the past generations. And this man wrote and said, if our expenditure on comforts, luxuries, amusements, etc. is up to the standard common among those with the same income as our own, we are probably giving away too little. If our charities do not at all pinch or humble us, I should say they are too small. There ought to be things we should like to do and cannot because our charitable expenditure excludes them. It's like you are giving till the luxuries of life you can't spend on them. Amen? Yeah, every week we have ladies. I have, we, ha we have known some ladies every week. They go to some salon and that salon it doesn't to change the hair. It's two thousand plus. Two thousand is actually the smallest amount. Yeah. So every week they are spending five thousand plus hair change, some luxuries, and even the husband doesn't notice. The people in the office, it's like they don't notice. Because maybe they are going through issues. So why should they notice the hair? <laughs> yeah. They are hungry. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, sacrifice. Then number five is secrecy. Secrecy. Now, secrecy speaks of living before an audience of one and doing things without others knowing about it. Secrecy. Living before an audience of one and doing things without others knowing about it. And this is very important. That we need, wherever we are living, we are living in the audience of one. Now I was telling the first service, because most of them are youths, that when I was a youth, what happened to me is when I could cook, I could picture myself like this, that somebody may be 
focusing some binoculars and looking how Richard behaves, how Richard lives. So they are watching me. So, like, I don't know, but some young people, you find that the souffria they have used to cook is the plate they are using to feed. Look at a man around you. They might have behaved like that when they were single. <laughs> Scooping from the souffria they used to cook. So when you are thinking the angels are around here, God is here, and so forth. That's what I was thinking. So I look for the best plate. I put it on the plate. I sit down. I feed. But most people, if we are not living in the audience of God, it's like God is here. In this office, God is here. Whatsoever I'm doing, even in this supermarket, even in with this mamamboka here, who is selling to me, God is witnessing. If I live consciously knowing that God is witnessing, I will not bacane mpaka nina click. Simang. Atanilisa, how could click? Yani you mpaka yani mshipa inatoka. Because of just bacaning. No, just Sometimes give them, give them, because they have children they want to feed, they have something to meet, and so forth. So think their need. Are we together, church? Okay, As I, because I'm finishing off so that we pray. The sixth one is simplicity. Simplicity. Now, simplicity speaks of learning to live with less. Learning to live with less. In other words, when you have met your basic needs with joy, you live in contentment. Yeah, you live in contentment, simplicity. And this is one of the areas which we as believers, we need to cultivate simplicity. Amen? Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I love you the way you are. Yeah, let them not complicate themselves, yeah? So that they are complicated, a funny hairstyle. <laughs> yeah. They are coming with, you know, ladies, those nails that are on this side of heaven. <laughs> so you are walking, even you don't, you don't want somebody to touch, or somebody, if they come near you, they fear to be pricked. No, no, no. Just live a simple life. Be con contentment is important. Why we are having land crappers, all those kind of corrupt guys, it's because the aspect of simplicity is denied in their lives. So they want to live large, to do things anyhow. And the problem is with money, you can never be contented with it. Once you get a little, the needs expand. Yeah. Remember, before you got that promotion or the more money you have, you are living in a single, maybe house, and you are very content, very happy. Now you graduated, you moved, you are finding you need, it, it's like, Things are coming. They need more of your money. More needs. Even if we add you again, you will find you move again. And more needs. Simplicity. Tell your neighbor simplicity. Now, the last one today is silence. Silence. Now, silence speaks of talking less and listening more. Being quiet before the Lord and others. Now, I know this is a lost art, but we need to cultivate it. Now, there is a quote there by the man, Sewi, uh, who is he? <laughs> Trying to find my notes here, because it's far. Oswald Chambers, 
He says, we call, we can all see God in exceptional things, but it requires the growth of spiritual disciplines to see God in every detail. We can all see God in exceptional things, but it requires the growth of spiritual disciplines. The growth of spiritual disciplines to see God in every detail. You know, if God performs some miracle, we will see him. We'll say God is seen. But when we develop spiritual disciplines, we will experience God in everything around us. Amen? Yeah, we will not say the devil. Yeah. But the devil. He ni shetani. Uh -uh. We will see God. God is at work here. Amen? Do you believe God is at work in your life, in your family? Yeah. We will see when we develop. Even the issues of Gen Z's going around and so forth, we will see God. God is picking something. We will not see the devil now, the devil amefamia Kenya. Uh -uh. We will want to see God. And therefore we will want to give him thanks. Father God, we thank you. We bless you. We lift you this afternoon as we present our lives to you. Lord, we know you desire us to grow in intimacy with you and to grow in our spiritual lives so that you may use us in our world. And therefore, I pray for these dear ones as I pray for myself and for us as a church, that, Lord, as we embark on learning on spiritual disciplines, that, Lord, you will grant us the grace to practice them in our lives, in our rela relationship with you, in, oh God, our spiritual walk with you. Help us in our day-to-day -day lives that we will cultivate them, oh God. I pray for my brothers and my sisters here who are struggling in their lives in one of the areas of these spiritual disciplines that, God, you release your extra grace upon them to be lifted up. Those who are, oh God, struggling to pray, may the grace and the spirit of prayer come upon them. May the heaviness and the clouds of darkness over their lives and their spiritual world be lifted off in the name of Jesus Christ. They that are struggling to study your word, may you, oh God, release your grace to study and to understand in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray for us as a church that lift us, oh God, even as we embark on this journey of learning on spiritual disciplines. Lift each and every one of us. Speak to us in our private and solitude times with you. May you speak to us in our silence as we wait on you. May you speak to us. Let us come up with great testimonies of your great doings. We thank you, Father, and we lift you in Jesus' name we pray. Somebody says a big amen. 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 God bless you. Amen.